Prefaces to the Bondage of the Will This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. De Servo Arbitrio On the Enslaved Will or The Bondage of the Will By Martin Luther Translated by Henry Cole Preface by Henry Atherton Minister of Grove Chapel Camberwell, S.E., and General Secretary of the Sovereign Grace Union. This excellent work of that eminent servant of God, Martin Luther, one of the noble reformers, is acknowledged to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of Luther's productions. Luther himself considered it his best publication. I had purposed writing a short account of each of the opponents, Erasmus and Luther, who come before us in the book, and of the controversy, but from lack of time owing to many calls, and wishing to get the volume into the hands of lovers of Luther as soon as possible, I had to forego this privilege. I believe I have succeeded in producing the best English edition of this masterpiece of Luther that has been published. Cole's translation has been used with slight alterations from Vaughan. My task has been a difficult one, especially as I am ignorant of the German language. Luther's scriptural quotations are, of course, in the German tongue, and as he often seemed to quote them from memory, and as no references to verses, and sometimes none to chapters are given, and sometimes the wrong name of the book is given, English concordances have been of very little help to me, and often no use at all. Yet I trust this edition will prove a success in spite of my handicaps. Although Luther used certain words that I should not employ, yet I have adhered faithfully to his own phraseology as translated by Cole. Luther speaks for himself. This book is most needful at the present day. The teachings of many so-called Protestants are more in accordance with the dogmas of the Papists or the ideas of Erasmus than with the principles of the Reformers. They are more in harmony with the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent than with many Protestant or Reformed confessions of faith. If the Lord should be pleased to open the eyes and understanding of some of these so-called Protestants, to whom I have referred, through the perusal of this work of the great reformer, Luther, enabling them to see that they are at present believing and teaching awful delusions contrary to the word of God, and the Protestant reformed religion, and causing them to return to the old paths, the labors of the Sovereign Grace Union will not have been in vain. The labor involved in the preparation of this work for publication in its present form has been enjoyable, although it has often been carried out in much pain, and sometimes during sleepless nights. I rejoice in being able to issue it, and do earnestly pray that the Lord will bless it to the ingathering of His elect, and to the maintenance of His cause and truth, in the days in which our lot has been cast. Grove Chapel Parsonage Camberwell Grove, S.E.S. June, 1931 Preface by the Translator The translator has long had it in meditation to present the British Church with an English version of a choice selection from the works of that great reformer, Martin Luther, and in November last he issued proposals for such a publication. He considers it, however, necessary to state that this treatise on the bondage of the will formed no part of his design when those proposals were sent forth. But, receiving subsequently an application from several friends to undertake the present translation, he was induced not only to accede to their request, but also to acquiesce in the propriety of their suggestion that this work should precede those mentioned in the proposals. The unqualified encomium bestowed upon it by a divine so eminent as the late Reverend Augustus Montague Toplady, who considered it a masterpiece of polemical composition, had justly impressed the minds of those friends with a correct idea of the value of the treatise, and it was their earnest desire that the plain sentiments and forcible arguments of Luther upon the important subject which it contained should be presented to the Church unembellished by any superfluous ornament, and unaltered from the original, except as to their appearance in an English version. In short, they wished to see a correct and faithful translation of Luther on the bondage of the will, without note or comment. In this wish, 
the translator fully concurred, and having received and accepted the application, he sat down to the work immediately, which was on Monday, December 23, 1822. As it respects the character of the version itself, the translator, after much consideration of the eminence of his author as a standard authority in the Church of God, and the importance of deviating from the original text in any shape whatever, at last decided upon translating according to the following principle, to which it is his design strictly to adhere in every future translation with which he may present the public. To deliver faithfully the mind of Luther, retaining literally as much of his own wording, phraseology, and expression as could be admitted into the English version. With what degree of fidelity he has adhered to this principle in the present work, the public are left to decide. The addition of the following few remarks shall suffice for observation. 1. The work is translated from Melanchthon's edition, which he published immediately after Luther's death. 2. The division heads of the treatise, which are not distinctively expressed in the original, are so expressed in the translation to facilitate the reader's view of the whole work and all its parts. The heads are these. Introduction. Preface. Exordium. Discussion. Part the first. Part the second. Part the third. And conclusion. 3. The subdividing sections of the matter, which in the original are distinguished by a very large capital at the commencement, are, in the translation, for typographical reasons, distinguished by sections 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. 4. The quotations from the diatribe are, in the translation, preceded and followed by a dash and inverted commas. But with this distinction... Where Erasmus's own words are quoted in the original, the commas are double, but single where the substance of his sentiments only is quoted. The reader will observe, however, that this distinction was not adopted till after the first three sheets were printed, which will account for all the quotations in those sheets being preceded and followed by double commas, though it is presumed there will be no difficulty in discovering which are Erasmus's own words and which are his sentiments in substance only. 5. The portions of Scripture adduced by Luther are in some instances translated from his own words, and not given according to our English version. This particular was attended to in those few places where Luther's reading varies a little from our version, as being more consistent with a correct translation of the author, but not with any view to favor the introduction of innovated and diverse readings of the Word of God. With these few and brief preliminary observations, the translator presents this profound treatise of the immortal Luther on the bondage of the will to the public, and he trusts he has a sincere desire that his own labor may prove to be in every respect a faithful translation, and that the work itself may be found under the divine blessing to be an invaluable acquisition to the church, a sharp threshing instrument having teeth, for the exposure of subtlety and error, a banner in defense of the truth, and a means of edification and establishment to all those who are willing to come to the light to have their deeds made manifest, and to be taught according to the oracles of God. Henry Cole, London, March, 1823 End of the Prefaces